Hi, everybody. It's Ajanette, and I am going to attempt to do your Chapter 10 lecture for Independent Measures T-Test. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I say attempt because um, I don't know if I'll be able to use the whiteboard much on this lecture. Um, my pen is not working properly. Uh, so let's see what I can do. Okay, so in chapter 10, we are covering the independent measures t-test, also known as an independent samples t-test. And so this is actually going to be um, going to be building on the single sample t, which as you should have seen, the single sample t is a lot like the, um, the z-score, right? So now you're comparing a sample to a population, um, and we don't know the standard deviation and, um, and or the mean for the corresponding population. So we substitute uh, and we use standard error for our um, single sample T. So now we're gonna build on that same concept. And let me see if I can, we're gonna build on that same concept. And instead of comparing a sample to a population, we're gonna compare two separate groups to one another. So maybe comparing men and women, comparing freshmen and seniors, comparing Republicans and Democrats, um, comparing dogs and cats, right? So we're there are different people in each group. So. Um, they are, the two samples are completely independent of one another. And so it's a really, it's really important to understand that. Um, we are um, definitely going to look at differences in a dependent variable based on those two different groups or conditions of the independent variable. So that's why it's called in independent measures or between groups design. So uh, when we're talking about um, all research, right, we're comparing two groups, but you, you've really got to look at the design and structure of those groups. Are um, they the same people in each group, like a pre and post test where you take um, my happiness scores, then put me in a comedy show, and then take my happiness scores again and compare the two and see if that comedy uh, show actually improved my happiness. Uh, that's me in both groups, right? In both samples and both sets of scores. I was pre-comedy show and I was post-comedy show. That's what we call a within subjects design or a repeated measures design. We're the same people, right? We're measuring within the same subjects multiple times repeatedly. Independent, I might look at um, comparing happiness scores between men and women to see if comedy shows impact men and women differently. Now, mind you, I'm well aware that gender is not binary. However, for a t-test, we're only comparing two groups to one another. Um, that might be more appropriate for a design that you're going to learn later on, which is an ANOVA, where we might compare um, cisgender men, cisgender women compared to non-binary individuals, compared to um, gender queer individuals, so on and so forth. Okay, But when you have different people in each group, that's what we call a between subjects design, which uses an independent measures or independent sample test. When you're comparing two tests to one another or two groups to one another, that's a t-test, okay? So you have to kind of know how many groups am I comparing? It's a t-test. And then who's in those groups? Are they the same people in those groups? If so, that's a within subjects design, which would use a repeated measures t. If there's different people in those groups or conditions, that's what we call it a between subjects design. And we would use an independent measures t-test. So again, with an independent measures t-test, um, I would have two different groups looking at two different signs and I'm comparing them, right? And this one, it's the same people seeing the one sign, measuring their reaction, seeing the other sign, measuring their reaction, and then comparing the same people's responses to different signs. This is comparing different people's responses, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So same um, kind of general formula for really all tests, right, where we're comparing the differences um, between the sample and the population. And we're dividing that by what we would expect to be reasonable differences um, based on standard error. So same thing, right? Only now I'm comparing the difference between the sample and the population. Here, I'm comparing the difference, the difference between those two groups of scores um, between the sample and the population. And I'm still gonna have an estimated standard error. So your denominator is always going to be an estimated standard error, but that formula is going to change up a little bit based upon the design of the study. So um, effectively, we're looking at a research design where we have two separate groups of individuals or participants in each treatment condition. There's two treatment conditions, so we're comparing two means. Um, between those two groups. And what we're trying to understand is, are there differences in the measured variable or in the dependent variable based upon um, the, the independent variable or between those two groups? So we're using an independent variable to separate out the people into two different groups, right? So gender, men and women, um, type of animal, dogs and cats. Um, flavor of ice cream, vanilla and chocolate, right? So that's our independent variable. And then we have two conditions or two treatment groups with different people in each group. So we're trying to say, okay, what is it that we're measuring? Um, we're measuring likeness of ice cream flavor. So um, how much do you like chocolate versus vanilla? And I have different people tasting chocolate and different people tasting vanilla or differences in love for ice cream between men and women, or differences in energy level between dogs and cats. And so it's differences in what I'm measuring between the two groups or the two um, conditions of my independent variable. As with all statistical techniques, we have assumptions that need to be maintained. So first of all, for a t-test, we're comparing two groups, two treatment conditions only. If you have three or more conditions, three or more groups, you have to look at another test. A t-test is only appropriate for two, two, two groups. You're looking at a scale variable. So you're measuring um, a dependent variable uh, on some interval or ratio scale. And then, of course, we're assuming homogeneity of variance. So the differences between the groups, the variance is similar between the two groups. You don't want to have one group that's significantly different from one another on their own, and then another group that's really similar. They're very homogeneous. And then comparing the two, that, that creates a bias in uh, the statistics, and so it's not effective. And then we want a normal distribution with no significant outliers. So how we do our notation for um, in independent measures T is now we introduce this concept called sample, right? And you have two separate samples. You have sample subscript one and sample subscript two. This represents the two separate treatment conditions. Your N1, again, you have subscript representing group one, group two. You have mean subscript, meaning mean one, mean two. You have sum of squares subscript. So you have the subscript one for group one, subscript two for group two. Our null is always going to be that we don't expect any significant differences between the two groups. So effectively, we're saying any difference between um, the groups, any difference in the dependent variable between the groups is just sampling error, right? So effectively, we're looking at the dis difference between the two groups equals zero. Okay, it's nothing significant. The alternate is the difference between the two groups does not equal zero or the means do not equal one another. So they are significantly different from one another. So our estimated standard error is also gonna change in terms of our formula. It needs to be a standard error that takes into consideration the fact that we have two means, we have two separate groups and we have a mean for each group. So effectively, we're gonna take our, our variance um, divided by our sample size for each group. Uh, and we're gonna take um, um, hold on a second. And we're gonna take our the distance between our means. 
So we need to look at the variance uh, divided by the sample size. And we need that for both groups. And the square root of that is going to be our standard error. So as we discussed before, standard error is what's a reasonable error that we should allow ourselves? What's a reasonable difference that we should expect between the two samples if there were, in fact, no differences, right? If the null hypothesis is true, because there's no such thing as truly no differences. There's going to be some differences. But what's the reasonable amount of difference? still assuming the, the null hypothesis is true. We also have something called a pooled variance. And a pooled variance is looking at, so we have a, a variance for group one, a variance for group two, and then the overall collective variance is what we call our pooled variance. And so what's the combined variances of the two samples? Um, but also considering that one sample might be larger than the other. Now for your t-test to be effective, you want your samples to be similar in size. If you have 100 people in one sample and only 20 in another, that's gonna throw off your statistics. But assuming the sample sizes are um, similar, your pooled variance allows us to consider um, an unbiased way of looking at the, the calculation. Um, to say, okay, what is the, um, the, the expected overall variance? And then what that's gonna do is now it's gonna allow us to do a modified standard error. So ultimately our standard error is, our standard error formula is gonna be um, our pooled variance over our sample size. And then again, our pooled variance over our sample size. And then our, um, so our standard error for an independent measures T is the symbol right here. Here's your final formula with the pooled variance. Okay, so effectively what we end up with now is we say, okay, the difference between the two groups within the sample, the difference between the two groups for the population. So if it's a null hypothesis, we would expect this to, um, this numerator to be zero, divided by our standard error um, for an in independent measures T. So here's your final formula. Um, just like with other scores, kind of the bigger the better. So when we see smaller T values, it's saying that the di difference between the two groups was really small not likely going to be in the critical region. It's not likely going to reject the null. And, um, you know, the differences may indicate that our independent variable didn't work, okay? Um, when you do have larger variability within each group, uh, then that can impact your standard error. And so that might cause you to have a smaller T value because remember, standard error takes variance into consideration. So larger variance means a larger standard error, which means a larger denominator, which means a smaller T. So larger variance within each group can actually um, result in not finding significant um, differences. Larger independent Ts uh, are, are indicative of larger distant differences between the two means. They're likely going to more likely to reject the null. And they, they mean we're going to have um, a larger T values, right? Typically smaller standard error because it's a smaller denominator will result in a larger T value. Your degrees of freedom also changes your formula for degrees of freedom also changes because now we have a degrees of freedom for each separate group. Again, those sample sizes may be different. So you have to take the sample, the number of people in group one minus one and the number of people in group two minus one so effectively your overall formula is N1 plus N2 minus two. So we're now minusing two, one for each group. Okay, so you learned about hypothesis testing back in chapter eight. Notice that the steps are still gonna be the same, whether we're applying it to an, a single sample T, an independent measures T or a Z-score, doesn't matter. We're gonna state our hypothesis and our alpha level. So your null and your your alternate hypothesis. 
your alpha level is typically going to be 0.05 for this class, P is less than 0.05. Based upon that, we want to calculate our degrees of freedom so we can identify our critical regions. Then we're going to compute the test statistic. We do all of this in SPSS, then we don't have to do number two or three, right? It'll do it for us. And then we're going to make a decision based upon the resulting T. Is it in the critical region? If so, then we reject the null. There are significant difference. If it's not in the critical region, then we fail to reject the null and say there are not significant differences between the groups. So here's our formulas for calculating degrees of freedom. Here's our formula for calculating the pooled variance. Here's our formula for calculating the estimated standard error based on the new pooled variance formula. And here's our final um, formula for the t -bell. So here's a learning check. I'm gonna encourage you um, to walk through the steps. Assuming in your first group, you have a mean of three and a sum of square deviation of 16. Group two, you have a mean of six, a sum of square deviation of 24. You're going to go through based on an alpha level of 0.05, and you're going to say, is there a significant difference? These are two separate jury groups. Is there a significant difference in their sentencing recommendations between the two groups? Um, both are given the same instructions, except group two was told there was ev additional evidence withheld by the judge, and group one did not have that knowledge. So does that knowledge impact um, sentence recommendations. And so um, here are your um, your figures. Here's your exact um, exact individual raw data. And you're going to go through the steps with the formulas provided. So go ahead and pause and see what you come up with. So now if you have gone through the calculations, you'll see that um, here's our null hypothesis. We expect the difference be to, to be zero, right? Or the, the, and we always write our null and alternate in terms of population values. So we expect them to be zero or um, they're not equal to zero is the alternate, right? Here's our degrees of freedom because we had, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people in each group. So eight plus eight minus two, 16 minus two is 14. Then I gave you your sum of squared values plus our degrees of freedom. And then we calculate that out. So your 2.86, your critical region was positive or minus 2.145. 2.86 is in fact beyond the 2.145, so it is in fact in the critical region. You find that by looking at the T table. So look at your degrees of freedom and your alpha level, and that'll show you where you got these borders. Our 2.86 is beyond the border, so it is in fact in the critical region. Calculating our pooled variance, again, that and um, that um, you can go back to the original formulas for the pooled variance. And effectively, our estimated standard error now is 0.85. And then we take the, the um, dis differences between the means and divide that by 0.85. Our T is 3.53. It is in fact then, um, Oh, I'm sorry, the 2.86 is not beyond, this is not our T value. This is our, our pooled variance calculation, the 2.86, which then we plugged in to get our estimated standard error. So this is the pooled variance calculation. This is the estimated standard error. This is our final T, where we take our means divided by our estimated standard error. And negative 0.353 is in fact beyond the 2.14. Four, five, which is in the critical region. So we're going to reject the null. Our statement of evidence is the mean difference between juror groups were significantly different. T, here's our degrees of freedom, equals negative 3.53, comma, P is less than 0.05 two-tailed test. So our statement of interpretation is the jury group told, so look at the one and two, it was the, the second group, um, 
that there was additional evidence withheld had significantly longer sentences, mean equals six, than the juror group not informed about the evidence, a mean of three. We, because there were significant differences, we want to calculate the effect size and determine the magnitude of those differences. So we know that um, being told about evidence with how does cause differences between the two groups. So what is the size of that difference? So we're going to take our mean for each group divided by our pooled variance. Um, is for estimated D, remember Cohen's D, or you can use a percentage of variance accounted for or explained in the DV based on the IV. This is the one that's gonna be more common. And so that all you have to do, that is symbolized by R squared. And you tip it, all you have to do is take the square T. So take your T value squared divided by your T value squared plus your degrees of freedom. So we would plug that in, um, in for these values here, right? Your T value squared divided by your degrees, or excuse me, plus your degrees of freedom, right? The other third option, so now you have three options, is your confidence interval. And your confidence interval, remember, is that gold post, right? Where you're saying, okay, here's where my um, samples fell, the mean difference for my samples, I, based upon that, I can predict with a certain degree of confidence that the corresponding population mean difference would fall somewhere between here and here. And so, um, so that's the formula for that. Um, first, you're going to write out your entire formula, right? Then you're going to, you're also going to need your pooled variance. Um, and this is for your, your um, standard error and then your degrees of freedom. So first you do um, the estimated standard error, calculate your degrees of freedom. You look at the T value that uh, corresponds to um, that. And then you know that you're, you're gonna plug that in now as your gold post, right? Cause it's gonna be, um, the T times the standard error on the plus end and then on, on the minus end and on the plus end. Okay. So that is all assuming we're doing two-tailed tests. And um, if for some reason we have some sort of really solid theoretical perspective or the literature tells us we can likely make a prediction on directions, then we're going to, um, we're going to do a one-tailed or a directional hypothesis. And uh, if that is the case, then we're gonna say that it's, that our, um, our mean for our experimental group is uh, either expected to be less than or equal to the control group, or greater than or equal to the control group. Again, using population and not sample um, notation because we're making that prediction. We follow the same exact steps, except now we're doing a prediction and now our critical region is piled up on the side of our prediction. So instead of taking that 0.05 and, and dividing it across that distribution, and doing 0.025 on both ends, now we're taking that 0.05 and we're either putting it all um, on the lower than or all on the greater than side. Okay, so this is really just giving you a little bit more explanation on the pooled um, variance and, and its relationship to sample size. So, you know, keep in mind that you're your standard error does take into consideration sample size. So the bigger you, the sample that you have, the bigger, um, or excuse me, let's go back. Um, when we're looking at your standard error, I'm gonna go back um, two more. When you're looking at your standard error, 
bigger, bigger sample sizes are going to um, result in a smaller number here that's gonna that's gonna ultimately be um, we're gonna take the square root of that end product. And so we're actually gonna end up with a greater standard error and a smaller t, right? So the larger uh, the sample, um, the larger the sample, as with many tests, um, the better, right? Because you want to minimize your standard error as best as possible. So when we're talking about bigger mean differences, we're most likely going to have a significant T. Um, you get larger numerators and smaller, um, smaller denominators, which is going to result in a bigger T. Larger variance causes a, a bigger standard error, which unfortunately is going to reduce the size of our, our T value. And then in terms of sample size, sample size produces the smaller standard error. So it helps to reduce the denominator and increase our T. So big, we are hoping for big mean differences, small variance, and big sample sizes. As with any test we talked about, you want to shoot for about minimum of 30 people in your sample. Okay, and in each, each group, right? So a total of 60. So we do have assumptions. We have to make sure we're not violating. First of all, we need to know that um, the, the participants in each of the samples are independent of one another. The populations from which the samples were drawn are normal populations. And that there's similar variants in each of the groups or homogeneity of variants. Um, we do want to test and see if we violated that homogeneity, and we can use the Hartley's FMAX test to do that. Um, and SPSS does it for us as well. And effectively, one way that we can try to control that is to make sure the sample sizes are as similar as possible between each group. And then we can check our, our formula here for the Hartley's FMAX test uh, to see if, in fact, um, the variance is similar or, or not. So um, what you're looking for, if you have um, a huge FMAX test, then that's saying that, yeah, they're pretty different because you're dividing them from one another, you know, into one another. So small FMAX values indicates there's a smaller difference in those variances, which is a good thing. It means you didn't violate that homogeneity of variance. This has its own critical values table in the back of the book as well. And we wanna do our best to make sure we are not in fact violating homogeneity. If we do, then we do workarounds that are beyond the scope of class. Um, but in SPSS, it'll tell you the first one is assuming equal variances. And then um, if you violate that, then you have to focus on line two. Okay. Okay. So um, I hope this is helpful. Uh, I, I actually think independent measures t-tests are fairly common. You'll do them for research methods. You'll likely do them for other studies as you move on throughout your undergraduate degree. So it's a really helpful task to learn. We typically do not do them by hand. We plug everything into SPSS. When you have, you know, I think I, I'm, we're doing a study right now with over 300 participants. Of course, we're not gonna hand crank that data. It makes more sense to plug it into SPSS. So the most important thing is knowing when to use an independent measures t-test. Anytime you're comparing two groups um, there, and you, know, you have a scale variable you're comparing between those two groups, then it's a t-test. And when there are different people in each of those groups, then it's an independent measures t-test or an independent samples t-test. Hope that helps. And let me know if there's any questions. Bye. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop recording. Okay, bye everyone.